How does wrestling other people in overweight pajamas or even worse clothes that barely qualify you to get service in a restaurant take you from this to the first? Let's get the lineage discussion out of the way. I'm a purple belt under Matt Jubera, who was the first person that Sanji Hibero ever gave a black belt to and the fourth American that Solo Hibero ever gave a black belt to. And if you know jujitsu, you know the Hibero brothers and they got their black belt from Hoyler Gracie, who, well, you, you probably know. So I'm by no means an expert, but I'm also not a one-stripe white belt raving about his mat-based revelations on Reddit. I'm a pretty good purple belt. After my battle with acute viral myocarditis seven years ago, I was lost. By the time I picked up jujitsu five years ago, I was frankly on a one-way express to like every stereotype that you can imagine about the modern American tech bro performance optimization giga chad. I had zero in-person friends that I spent any time with. I was emotionally closed off. I shaved my own head to save the $30 and was super bought into the fire movement. My entire life revolved around the pursuit of personal development and honing my body and running from this near-death experience that I had. My morning routine was less routine and some sort of divine summoning ritual that I thought was the only thing keeping me between being okay and living my life on the streets as some sort of like drug-addled, destitute, homeless person. I listened to the Joe Rogan podcast incessantly and even though that's not quite what led me to jiu-jitsu, it was where I got most of my ideas from. I really only read whatever the latest self-help book was and I firmly believed that all you had to do was own the day quote unquote, and you could own your entire life. I eventually went full monk mode, AKA I became a shut-in. I never really picked up dating again after my last breakup, and I didn't really ever leave my house except to go to work, the gym, or like the grocery store. When I started seeing my therapist at the time, she asked me what I did for play and I might as well have laughed in her face. I was a man in his early 20s on a mission to like wrangle my life and my subconscious into submission. There's no room for play in that. And Jordan Peterson told me that as long as I clean my room and come to understand my similarities to lobsters, eventually everything will be okay. He didn't tell me to play. At this point, I was honestly kind of afraid of interacting with other people and I was really judgmental towards them. And it, that was kind of a way of preventing me from being judged. I guess then maybe it was kind of a happy accident that my parents had decided to open a boxing and MMA gym as kind of a side project investment thing. And as a show of support for them and out of you know, some degree of curiosity, I decided to try a jiu-jitsu class. The first time I ever trained, I got absolutely manhandled by someone half my size and twice my age. Since then, I can't even count the number of times that a teenager, a woman half my size, or a man twice or more my age has kicked the absolute crap out of me. These are people who on paper should have no business being able to do that to me. And I went into jujitsu thinking that because I was a big, strong, capable, young bodybuilder that I'd be impregnable, untouchable, and nothing could have been further from the truth. And for someone as self-absorbed and consumed by his own ego as I was at that time, this was a profound experience that is really what made me want to do jujitsu. I wanted to understand how this was possible, and I, I was deeply invested in becoming, like, kind of good at this thing that didn't seem to make any sense to me and really just had kind of shattered my ego in one go. I had wrestled in high school, so I had somewhat of a foundation and I actually really loved wrestling as someone who never did team sports and never really participated in athletics. Wrestling was my first exposure to like, even though it's not a team sport, it really like it's individual, but it has a team aspect to it. I felt like I was part of something. I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself and part of a community. And in those early days of jujitsu, it really, really reminded me of what my first few days on the wrestling team felt like. It, made me feel like I was part of something again, and it gave me something to look forward to every day. I had training partners and coaches and professors who I was like kind of responsible towards showing up and showing up at my best for. And maybe most importantly, though this really didn't come until a little bit later, jujitsu taught me how to play again. And to, I know that sounds maybe kind of crazy given like what jujitsu is, but it's still by far the most playful thing that I do. It's, it's such a source of joy and creativity for me. <laughs> so as to avoid becoming a jujitsu nepo baby, and also because the, the school I started out was only no gi, uh, I decided to change schools so that I could get exposure to the gi, and also train somewhere that wasn't my parents' gym. And this is where I still train five years later. It's my third place. Third place is a term that sociologist Ray Oldenburg coined. And if you think about your first place being work or school, 
and your second place being home. A third place is somewhere else that you go, somewhere that you spend a lot of your time. And they are locations where we exchange ideas, build relationships, and have a good time. And as an adult, Jubera's has been the most consistent fixture in my life. And Professor Jubera and some of my training partners might think that's kind of crazy because I have this habit of disappearing every now and again, but it really is. Remember how I mentioned the friendlessness earlier? Well, about two months into training at Jubera's, I was about to leave for my first trip to Japan. And as I was talking to somebody about this in the locker room, someone else, friendly blue belt I had seen around, kind of like piped up and was like, hey, my name's Ben. I just got back from Japan with my girlfriend. We had the most incredible time. And if you want, we can exchange numbers and I'll give you some recommendations from our trip. We exchanged numbers and I really just like felt more excited to be equipped for the trip and kind of in like a low bandwidth twist of fate. I never actually got the text message she sent me because it wouldn't download. But after I got back, we started to hang out a lot. There was no way I possibly could have known that I had just met my best friend and brother for life. Last April, I had the incredible pleasure of getting to officiate his wedding to one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met. He and I go on an annual boys trip. Every other year it's ADCC, which will be in Vegas this summer, which I'm super excited about. We get coffee every other Thursday and we get to train together four to five times a week. And while Ben is by far the most significant relationship I've cultivated through jujitsu and the one I'm most grateful for, it's by no means the only one. I went from feeling alone and isolated, struggling to connect with anyone, to having this kind of burgeoning social life and being surrounded by people I care about a lot. And while I could have certainly made friends through any medium, jujitsu happens to be the route that worked for me. Though I do think there's something special about jujitsu. I'll share an anecdote that one of my professors likes to use a lot when he's kind of ending class, giving the speech, whatever. He says that you don't choke your family members for fun. You have this kind of unique bond with people you do jujitsu with where you're, you're willingly engaging in something that's actually really dangerous and just trusting each other to be respectful and honor kind of the rules of the game. And there's a really unique kind of special closeness that comes from that, that kind of situation. Jujitsu, because of this, has this really unique capacity to level the playing field and bring a bunch of different people from a bunch of different backgrounds together, working towards a common goal and really kind of removing a lot of the barriers to entry you might find in some some other hobbies. And I think this unique ability to connect people and even things out for them is why it's rapidly becoming one of the like fastest growing sports in the world, particularly with how disconnected our world is now. About two years ago, I moved to Seattle for a new job. And while I was extremely excited for this opportunity personally and professionally, uh, I had always loved visiting Seattle. I love the food. I love the nature. It's beautiful. I love the pop culture and the history and the music that's come out of that city. You know, I was really excited for all those things, but I was really disappointed and, and saddened to be leaving my family at Jubera's behind. But I also did have a recommendation for a new gym in Seattle from the man himself. And that gym's called Praxis and it's run by a guy named Larry. Larry is also phenomenal. And that's one of the great things about jujitsu. Wherever you go in today's world, you'll be able to find a gym. And I firmly believe that water seeks its own level. And so if you're at a good gym at home, when you're traveling, I do think you're more than likely than not to find a good gym. And of course, not all jujitsu gyms are good. You don't have to go very far down the BJJ subreddit to see that sometimes there's horror stories, but like if people you trust tell you to go to a place, you can trust that it's good. I loved training at Praxis. It's in kind of this like shoddy old house and it, and I mean this in the best way possible, it feels like you kind of got dropped into a rocky training montage. Oh man, they're like a special kind of crazy because they oftentimes do nine minute rounds, which if you train, you know that's wild. But Praxis really very quickly developed a very soft spot in my heart. It's not quite Jubera's to me, but still to this day, I look back on it really fondly. But I only lived in Seattle for about nine months, whether it was the weather or the lack of purpose in my job or the Seattle freeze, which is an extraordinarily real thing. Don't let anyone tell you differently. I can't be sure what caused it, but I do know that this became an extraordinarily dark period of my life. And for a while, training at Praxis was the only thing that kept me afloat. But eventually my kind of long running struggles, but they became really, really difficult struggles with mental health. Got me to a point where like, I could barely leave my apartment to do anything other than walk my dog. And even that was a really tall order because I lived in a building with a 24 hour desk person. And like, I had, to, I had to talk to them to get out of the building. And like, even that felt like too much. I gave up. I drank a lot. I spent time with people I didn't even really like to be around instead of being at the gym. I started behaving in ways that I was really not okay with. And I felt 
devastated, alone, just bad. I cried almost every day and there were days I could barely, if even, get out of bed. It got worse and worse as time went on and I wasn't actually sure how much longer I'd be able to hold out for. But I did know that I had a trip to Japan that winter. I knew that I was officiating Ben's wedding in April and I knew that I had submitted paperwork to get a visa approved to move to Japan the following October. And so I thought that, you know, with enough of these big milestones ahead of me, maybe maybe I could hold on for a little bit longer. Hindsight being what it is, I feel so lucky that I had such big things to look forward to because I don't know if I could have made it through that time without those. When I came back to Denver for Ben's wedding, the right combination of people said the right things at the right times, and I never boarded my flight back to Seattle. I decided that it was time to stay home and to figure out what was gonna come next. I canceled my visa application to Japan. I got permission to work remotely from my job in Seattle, and I just, decided that I wanted to get better. And I knew that a huge part of getting better was gonna be getting back on the mats at Jiberis. I don't know if I would still be here without the friendships I've made through jujitsu. And jujitsu gave and continues to give me a sense of purpose that nothing else in my life really does. Persevering through all of my self-doubt and negative self-talk and kind of internal demons for long enough to get promoted to purple belt is one of the biggest accomplishments of my entire life. And I feel a tremendous sense of accomplishment and purpose when I'm helping a brand new white belt get familiar with the gym and some of the basic techniques, or when I'm having a great round with a really good training partner. I feel that sense of purpose in a way that I don't feel anywhere other else in my life. And on the worst days when not much else makes sense, I know that I have a place I can go where the people care about me, we can work towards something together, and I can just turn my brain off for a little bit. And everyone there wants me to get Better, and I want the same thing for them and we can lift each other up and that's a really special thing. So all that said, jujitsu maybe is not the answer for you and if you're in a really dark place, call the numbers. Reach out and get help. And that's advice you hear everywhere all the time from a bunch of different directions. So the best, maybe unique advice I can give you is try something new. That can be something as benign as taking a left instead of a right on your daily walk or getting a matcha instead of a coffee in the morning. Like it could be something Something as big as moving cities or starting a brand new hobby or changing careers, but like do something different. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And for me, deciding to change my hobby and focus so much on jujitsu took me from a lonely shut-in who didn't know if life was worth living to someone who feels really, really grateful to be here. So if you've made it this far, as always, thank you so much. It's people like you who make it possible for me to continue to feel like I can make these videos. And if you're one of the hundreds of new subscribers who landed here after my Mexico City video, which is still <laughs> blowing my mind, welcome and thank you. I still can't believe that we've crossed the thousand subscriber mark. It's something I'm so proud of and so excited to continue building on. And I'm really, really glad that you're part of it. So if you've ever trained jujitsu or if you're thinking about training jujitsu, I would love to hear about it in the comments. One of my favorite things is just like talking shop about this with people. And I know there's a ton of people on YouTube who can relate to this experience and have trained. So drop me a comment, I'd love to talk to you. And that said, if you enjoyed this video, the single best thing you can do is hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for the next one. With that, till next time folks.